the first time it happened, I was actually really embarrassed. But that was uh, the first time that I became super elite <laughs> with Air Canada, which means you travel, you know, over at least 100,000 miles. My name is John Dick. I'm a cancer research scientist at Princess Margaret Hospital, the University of Toronto, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, or the OICR. And uh, we do a lot of work at the intersection between stem cells and cancer. We're really trying to understand how the blood system works. And then the second part of that is to figure out how stem cells play a role in cancer, and particularly in leukemia. There's many things that one gets out of travel. I grew up on a farm. I went to a one-room school. When you travel around, I know people, most scientists from all over the world. You know, there's a lot of places I go to where my colleagues, you know, their parents were, you know, academic, academics in some form or other. Or, you know, they clearly came from, from uh, the uh, sort of the intellectual elite. Um, and if I look at a lot of my colleagues uh, here in Canada, that's not the case. People were able to grow up and follow their follow their passions. And I think that speaks a lot to, to what we've created uh, in this country to, to accommodate that. My lab is an international effort, right? My lab is not me. My lab is the students and postdocs and technicians and research associates that are in that lab. And they come from all parts of the world. And that, I think, creates the healthy dynamic for my lab as well. It's not insular. It's not just a local way of thinking. I only get those students by the exposure, if I talk at a conference in Shanghai or Heidelberg, that, uh, you know, there's either supervisors or students that are in the audience and they're going to go, oh, I really like that. And I want to do my next set of training in, you know, in Toronto. You know, I spent the first 15 years of my career at SickKids. And every day when I walked in, just the way our lab was, I'd often walk through, I'd just walk through the corridor or through the oncology ward. And... You know, you see these little kids running around that, you know, no hair, they're linked up to IVs. But for the most part, you know, are really happy. You know, these little kids are just running around. You just, it, it, it focuses your attention, you know, it focuses your mind that this isn't just a theoretical, it's not just a puzzle, it's not just a, a cool thing to do, but there's actually an end game. Stem cells are these potent cells. They're like these nurse cells or mother cells in our bone marrow, and they continuously produce blood. Stem cells are rare, they're like one cell in a million. So if I look in your bone marrow, many of those cells look the same under the microscope. There's no way of distinguishing this one from that one. So in the back of our mind, we've had this, you know, this is a, an experiment that's likely not gonna work. Um, but if it does, it'd be really cool. So it took us about a year almost, eight or nine months to put the system all together. And, you know, it worked the very first time. I can now have a million cells or tens of millions of cells run them through a special machine and, and put the 99.99% of cells into one test tube and the remaining cells, the rare ones in this test tube, take both of them and transplant them into our mice. These ones will never cause blood to grow in a mouse. This ones will do very potently for the lifetime of the mouse. Well, what about leukemia? I mean, every cell, people typically thought that, you know, every cell, you know, every cell is equally bad. We could then, you know, basically do that experiment and actually give the proof that there was such a thing as a stem cell for cancer. The problem is that these leukemia stem cells, these stem cells that are driving leukemia, actually are dormant. And so they could be swimming in a sea of chemotherapy agents and they're not going to be touched by it. Patient comes in, they're treated with these drugs. It looks like the disease goes away, and then, you know, a year later, two years later, the disease comes back. So that's, you know, captured a lot of attention of people in the, in the cancer research community, you know, over the last while, to see how true this is for not blood cancers, but for solid kinds of cancers. Because we, you know, did some of this original work, it's meant a lot of travel as well, because people want to hear about the work, some of the concepts behind it. Science thrives on communication. Science is a community effort, and nobody has enough good ideas. But what I'm talking about actually is more than communication. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a human dialogue. It's a human interchange. And you still have to have people intersecting and interacting and sitting together, having a drink or sitting at a, you know, just having a meal together, uh, that kind of thing. So science, traveling, conferences, that interaction is, you know, it's one part what I can get from the knowledge base, just the interaction from the other people. And I just love science. I love experiments. I love being in the lab and uh, discovering things that are new.
if you you know if you ask me now, I think what it was is when I was a kid taking those motors apart, lawn engines, all the stuff that we did on the farm, just the curiosity. And what I realized was that it was just curiosity um, as well that was really the driver. And I was able to take advantage of it. I was able to you know, fulfill that part of uh, what I wanted to do.